Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, Making Data-Driven Decisions with Automated Signal Performance Measures. My name is Connor, and I'll be your moderator. Before we get going on today's webinar, just a quick th a few things to run through. All phone lines are muted. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature within your GoToWebinar toolbar. Today's presentation will last about 50 minutes or so, which will give us time for questions at the end. Uh, by attending today's webinar, you are eligible to earn TARP points um, with IMSA. For those of you who went ahead and provided your IMSA during the registration process, Western Systems will go ahead and handle that submission for you. And lastly, today's webinar will be made available. Uh, you can watch it anytime on demand by um, checking it out on our website. All right, with the housekeeping out of the way, I'm excited to introduce today's presenter. Jason Spencer, Territory Manager for Western Systems. Jason, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Connor. And uh, thank you everybody for tuning in again for this edition of our webinar series. Um, I'm sure we have some repeat, view repeat viewers as well as some new viewers. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, we're trying to keep in touch with our customers with what would be a pretty you know, non-traditional way of doing things. But with our current situation as it still remains, uh, we thought this would be a great way for us to reach out to everybody and share this kind of information with you guys and stay in touch. So I hope everybody's staying happy, healthy, staying sane. As you guys can see, I'm in dire need of a haircut, but other than that, we're doing well over here. So a little bit about us here at Western Systems. Uh, we're still open for business. We've separated out our manufacturing into different shifts to be able to comply with social distancing without sacrificing our production deadlines. Uh, we consider ourselves really lucky. You know, we've heard some other companies aren't as lucky as we've been to keep things running. So happy to say, knock on wood, uh, we've we haven't experienced any kind of slowdowns in our supply chains and we're able to continue to supply our customers with what they need. Uh, with that said, a little background on Western Systems. Uh, we've been around since 2001, so that means we're quickly approaching our 20 year anniversary. Uh, about six years ago, we moved into our new headquarters, which is a 30,000 square foot building to better serve our customers. And we went from, gosh, what was it? A five person crew to over 40 employees now, and we're continuing to grow. I think we just hired on two or three more people just this month. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, at the very beginning, we just started making traffic signals for the state of Washington. Uh, but since then, we've expanded our product offerings to include everything you might need out there at the intersection. Uh, at our facility, we do have an in-house TMC operations center. Uh, this is a great place for us to showcase our equipment uh, to make any kind of uh, remote command center, I guess you could say, so that we could get into our customers' uh, setups through a VPN if they need any kind of assistance. Uh, definitely recommend if you're in the Washington area to come check it out. It's, it's a really cool piece of equipment. Uh, we've quickly become one of the largest manufacturers, uh, traffic manufacturers in the Pacific Northwest. So now we cover not just Washington, but we cover Oregon, Idaho, Montana, all of California, and Alaska. I personally think that what makes Western really stand out from the competition isn't just that we have such a fast product line, but you know we're really a customer support oriented business model. So we've you know, taking the time to build a team that has all of the answers to your questions and that have, you know, just a really wide background of experience so that they can help with any of your issues, be it something to do with hardware or be it trying to solve a complex, unique problem. That's kind of where we stand strongest. So as Connor said, today I want to talk to you guys about ATSPMs, uh, Automated Traffic Signal Performance Measures. Um, you know, they effectively come in three, there's three components to an ATSPM. There's the first, which is a suite of performance measures. Uh, the second would be a data collection tool. And the third would be the analysis of this data. So again, suite of performance measures, a data collection tool, and then a way to analyze this. Uh, the primary point of SPMs is reaching the goal of having an objectives and performance-based approach to managing traffic signals. Uh, today, I'm gonna take you through a brief history of how single performance measures have been used in the past, how they've evolved, and then take you into the recent automation of these signal performance measures. And then finally, we're gonna dive into what ITERIS, uh, who we represent, has to offer in the way of ATS PMs. And also, very recently, they've announced that they've uh, included the ClearGuide data sets or their ClearGuide software into their ATS PM software. So really, really cool stuff, a lot to cover today. So I'm gonna try my best to, to hit all the main points. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Uh, as Connor said, at the end, I'll cover any of your questions that you have, but if anything comes up after this, I, I totally come out, call me, send me an email, ask me anything you got, I'd be happy to dive into any of these programs deeper with you. 
So let's talk about the original SBMs. Uh, in the early days, traffic signal controllers were driven by uh, electromechanical motor. So this would turn and it would change the lights from green to yellow to red. And when it would get especially cold outside, ice would actually build up on this cam assembly. And the dial would stop spinning, so that would stick the signal in whatever state it was in. So to remedy the situation, police officers would actually walk up and smack the front of the cabinet with their batons, and that would shake the ice off and un unstick the cam assembly. So in an interesting way, the original form of SPMs was going out and looking at the front of a traffic controller and judging it by the amount of dents and scuffs that it had in the front. Obviously, this is kind of an anecdotal story, but it kind of leads into how you're able to track what's going on at your intersection and understand how well it's performing. So let's talk about the real deal traditional pro, uh, process. So traditional operations agencies would model in a lot and they'd measure actually very little. Uh, the highway capacity manual is sort of the guiding document for traffic signal timing design and has been incorporated into a lot of software tools that agencies use. These tools accept hourly traffic signal volumes, so agencies would go out and collect turning movement counts to give vehicle trajectories at the intersection, and they would do this manually over a week or two weeks. Since these models would only take in hourly data, so, that, so you had to take this collected data and compress it down into a one-hour data set and then feed it into these models. Engineers would then take that data into a specific time-space diagram, which is used to coordinate or design coordination for these signals. That data is input into the controller once it comes out of the, the other side of that and they're able to confirm it and put in at each intersection. To evaluate the success of this timing, a manual floating car study would usually be done uh, and this would be able to get travel times as you go through the whole corridor. And this would lead to the repetitive process of tweaking and retesting until times get to an acceptable range. And this would happen maybe once every three to five years, depending. Uh, between these times is when agencies would rely on public complaints as a form of performance measure. Uh, as more complaints would come in, more slight changes would be made to the timings and different at the different intersections along this corridor. And as time would pass and all these changes would be being made to each of these intersections, the entire coordination would start to deviate further and further and further from the original design. And this is what would ultimately, re ultimately result in a entirely new round of data collection, modeling, implementation, implementation testing, and then around and around you go, constantly trying to improve your timing of your signals. And this all would cost exorbitant amounts of money and, and quite a bit of time. Hardware maintenance is done very similarly. Uh, if we talked about the total cost of maintenance, it's uh, an outcome of the frequency of preventative routine and emergency maintenance. So I've got this graph here, and if you start on the left side of the graph and do a lot of preventative maintenance, it's gonna cost you a lot, but it's gonna reduce the amount of emergency maintenance needed because you're replacing these components proactively. Obviously, you don't wanna to be too far to the left or too far to the right, because that's where you incur a lot of cost or you incur a lot of number of failures. So you wanna find yourself kind of in the middle of this graph, where I believe that's a performance and objectives-based approach uh, to, to taking care of your, your hardware at the signal. This traditional approach to signal timing and maintenance has had a great impact on our scoring on the National Traffic Signal Report Card. Um, this is an assessment conducted by the National Transportation Operations Coalition, or the NTOC. Uh, grading themselves in five areas, 241 respondents representing approximately 39% of all traffic signals in the United States completed this self-assessment. And for over a decade, municipalities around the country had received very low scores on these report cards, with scores ranging from D- minus to D- plus overall from the years 2005 to 2012. Uh, the two weakest areas that have consistently been program management and performance assessment. Uh, when you think about program management, you get into the goals and objectives of the program, and this is where we're going to talk about how performance measures and, and how those are, it follows that having weak performance measures is going to lead to overall weak program management. And this is primarily due to how expensive and time consuming it is to collect this data. As I mentioned, collection methods were primarily done using floating car uh, studies or even roadside surveys. Uh, that's when you would literally stop people as they're driving, ask them where they're coming from, where they're going, how long it's taken them. Uh, these methods were effective up to a point, but a very lim a limited point due to lack of sample size and such short times of observation. I mean, sitting in an intersection for a single day or sitting in an intersection for a week is not enough time to gain a full understanding of how it is operating. And having a system that's oriented in complaints from the public about how the signals are performing leads to a really reactive approach to signal management. 
So high resolution data was pioneered by Purdue in partnership with INDOT, that's Indiana uh, Department of Transportation and some controller manufacturers in 2005. Uh, this led to the ability to log data from the controller 10 times a second. So every 10th of a second that controller is able to store data. It wasn't initially available, the data to be communicated remotely because of the technology at the time. So it'd be stored at the controller and would have to be collected manually going out there and loading it onto a drive. It's a bit cumbersome, but having this data was a huge step forward in being able to understand how your intersections are performing and what's going on out there. So before high-res data was available, only volume and occupancy metrics were available. And those were collected, I think, in 15-minute bins. Now these data sets are available, painting a much more detailed picture of what is happening at each individual intersection. Uh, these metrics can be used in a multitude of ways, such as improving the safety of roadways and intersections, uh, much faster response times for maintenance needs, and the ability to understand the demand trends on the roadways, allowing for future expansion and upgrades. Uh, all these essentially lead to saving time, money, and lives. Uh, the next logical step, though, is taking, finding a way to take this data and interpreting it and presenting this data effectively. So in 2012, UDOT released uh, ATSPMs. So this is the automated traffic signal performance measures. So they took the Purdue models and uh, data, and they're able to push it even further towards an objective and performance-based approach to performance measures. And this was essentially the missing link between traffic data and traffic signal control management. So UDOT made this software free and open for anyone to use. Um, it's great software. I, I totally recommend anyone go on there. If you search UDOT ATSPM, you'll go right to their website. Um, because it's free, it's not the most user-friendly system in the world. Obviously, it's user-driven, so it's not going to provide you with any kind of alerts, and it's pretty slow. Um, in the past, when I've given presentations like this, I've liked to pull up that website and go through it and show some of the, the graphs and data that they have on there, but unfortunately, it just proved to be so slow that I, I decided this is not worth it sometimes. So now with ATSPMs, agencies are able to overhaul the traditional signal retiming process with a much less expensive and time-consuming method allowing for a dynamic system of managing their networks. Uh, no longer does an agency have to manually observe, model, apply, then test and retest their settings to find this appropriate configuration. This is a system that's gonna allow for a proactive approach to keeping their signal timing accurate and effective, dynamically leading agencies away from this traditional reactive approach to signal timing. And as I said before, Saving you time, saving you money is a huge deal for a lot of these agencies. Maintenance and operations are also able to flatten the spending curve by having access to metrics that can quickly let them know if their communications or detection equipment is working properly. They, now agencies can better direct funding to intersections that need it and no longer rely on reports from the public when something's gone wrong, leading to the tedious troubleshooting process at the intersection trying to find the culprit. You know, okay, you sat at this light for too long. Was it because the detection's failing? Was it because of some timing in the controller? That leads to just a yet another process of trying to locate really what's wrong. These are able to eliminate a lot of that time and get you straight to the issue. So now that we know a bit about SPMs, where they come from and what they are, I wanna talk about iTerrace's specific approach with their software. ITERRIS has made quite a name for themselves in the industry, developing hardware and services that span several branches of the traffic world. Uh, most notably, ITERRIS has developed industry-leading de detection equipment using both optical and radar technologies and some of their newer products. They've actually combined the two. I'll talk about that quickly here in a second. They've also developed several tools for multimodal and signal operations support. And so I'm going to be focusing purely on what they're providing for their signal performance measurement software. Uh, the operation of the SPMs with iTerrace is very simple, and the best part is it requires zero hardware to implement this. So essentially what's going to happen is your controller, which does need to be Linux-based, I'm going to probably touch on that a couple times today, uh, it's going to talk via FTP to your local server or your computer. That then is going to take that information and send it via the internet to a cloud-hosted site, uh, it's AWS-hosted, and then that is going to, that's where all of the uh, math is being done essentially and put it into an easy to use uh, easy to view user, user format on a web-based browser so you know a lot of people have asked what's the difference why wouldn't i want a local server for this and i think that's a that's a great question but when you think about over time how much data this is going to collect and store if you had a physical on-prem server rack for this you're going to run out of space which is inevitably going to lead to having to delete things um, having to add more hardware to keep up with that, 
that storage space. Whereas when you have it cloud hosted, you have unlimited storage. I mean, they're going to be able to store for decades worth. So you can always go back and see what was happening on this day 10, 20 years from now. Um, there's also a lot of other things that come with uh, having cloud hosted servers. Number one, you don't have to give anyone special, special access to be able to give you firmware updates or give you the latest uh, version of it. It's done automatically. When you sign on the web server, it's there. So I really like how ITERIS SPM has made this super simple, super easy to use, and it's not going to require you to go out and buy 118 physical cards that you need to go and plug in at every intersection. So ITERIS SPM doesn't require any kind of central traffic management software. Um, what you do need, as I mentioned, is a Linux board on your controller. This relates back to you know, 2005 when they developed the ability to log this data that is based on a Linux uh, capacity. You need some kind of Ethernet connectivity. So that could either be fiber, you can have Ethernet over copper, or you can even use wireless technologies to be able to pull this information in. And then you need detection. Detection is a huge point of this. You know, it could be video, it could be loops, it could be radar, it could be a combination thereof. But the more detection you have, the more data you're going to be able to bring back. And another great part of IETERIS SPMs is that they're totally agnostic. So it doesn't require specific hardware to work. If you're using, if agencies are using different controllers, or if we're talking about multi-agency partnerships, IETERIS SPM can lay over the top of this. So I talked about detection and how important it is. So right here is the ideal detector layout to get SPMs. Um, the detectors do need to be put on their own channels. Um, SPMs only know if a detector channel is on or off. They don't really care what kind of detection is being used. However, it does care where it's being placed. Um, SPMs are going to be looking for detection here at the advanced line, which is approximately about 400 feet back, sometimes farther, depending on the geometry of your intersection. And this is how you're going to get your coordination diagrams, your arrivals on green. It's going to look for your stop bar presence. This is where you're going to get your phase terminations. You're going to get your unnecessary wait times, green utilization, and then just past the stop bar, you're going to get these counts for turning movement counts and clearance interval activities. For this, there is a product that comes to mind. I would be doing myself a disservice if I didn't bring it up. ITERS does have the Vantage Vector. This is a combination of optics and radar detection. It uses radar to do your advanced. This is huge, especially up here in the Pacific Northwest where we get a lot of rain, uh, we get a lot of cloudy, nasty weather. This doesn't need perfect lighting conditions. It doesn't need perfect weather to be able to see back as far as 600 feet back. Using radar, it's perfect for this application. You get your lane by lane detection. It's gonna give you the data you need. And then because ITERIS has spent a lot of time developing some of the best optics detection, optical detection, you're going to be able to use their camera for your stop bar, and your past stop bar detection and turning movement counts. So combining these two things makes it so that you only need one sensor at each approach to give you all the detection you need to have proper data to come back for an SPM application. So here's kind of a quick view of what the SPMs are going to look like when you first get on. It's a dashboard with a map and it has the alerts built into it. Now the alerts are split into operational alerts and maintenance alerts, which is pretty unique. Tight Terrace, uh, a lot of places only give you the operational side of things. Um, at any intersection where there are alerts, when you're looking at the map, it's going to appear as a little dot. The more the alerts there are, the larger the bubbles will get. So it kind of operates kind of like a heat map. Um, having you know these alerts, you can you can come over here and I, I'll show you here in a second. But by hovering over, you're going to be able to see what kind of alerts are happening there. So you can it depends on what you're looking for uh, to point things in the right direction. So as I said, just by hovering, you're going to get a, a quick little bubble that pops up, and this is going to give you the list of the available reports that are available at each of those intersections. And this, again, is dependent on what kind of detection you have there. If you don't have advanced detection, you're not going to have the same reports available to you. And then you can you can click on those and, and get more more detail as well, which I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into in a lot more detail. So alert configuration is where you can make your custom alert settings that are user or intersection specific. Uh, this will tell you what kind of alerts you want to receive. Uh, you can set time ranges. This way, you're not gonna get max out alerts sent to you at three in the morning when no one's on the roadway. Uh, each individual user can create their own alerts. The maintenance team may be more interested in alerts that tell them about hardware failures, whereas the engineering team is obviously gonna be more interested in alerts about traffic flow and changes. 
Uh, users can add intersection rules to be more specific on what they want to know about. Uh, these are really easy to set up and they can be changed at any time. And once you set all of this up, this is kind of a quick view of what that alert's going to look like when it arrives in your email. So draws attention to what needs attention. It's not going to just be a list of things. It's going to tell you how many alerts you have, what kind of alerts they are, when they happened, what intersection they happened at. Uh, really easy, great way to keep up to date on what's going on out there. So the alert part is awesome, but let's get into, you know, as my mom would say, the meat and potatoes of the issue, which is the reports that are available when you're into your SPM software. This is your coordination diagram. This one's uh, quite popular. Um, you, you see it all over the place. This is something that Purdue really championed. Uh, this is gonna use your advanced detection to show vehicles where they're arriving, when they're arriving at the stop sign or stop bar relative to what the light is showing. So this is gonna show the phase that you're looking at, what plan it's on, um, how well your plan did, and the way it does that's actually really interesting. So up here you've got your AOG, which is your arrivals on green, and you've got your GT, which is green time. So it's a percentage of total time that's gonna be green. And what you do is you take your arrivals on green, you divide it by your green time, and you're able to get your PR score. And Itaris has told us that what you're shooting for is about a 1.5. Anything 1.5 or over means that you're doing pretty well on serving your platoons and serving people as they arrive at the stop bar. Uh, here on the diagram below, you can see the green time, that short bit of yellow time, and then the red time, and each black dot represents someone pulling to the stop bar. So this is a really great visual aid because you can just look at this and understand, I want more of these black dots to be in the green portion of this diagram. Uh, some other things that you can see here is you can easily change your date and time range that you want to look at. You can compare so if you do make a change, you can do a side-by-side -side comparison, which I'm gonna show you on the next screen. Um, and you can change uh, what kind of intervals you're looking at as well. So let's check, check out this comparison here. This is uh, real life. This is from one of our users. Uh, granted, this is a pretty extreme example, um, but I think it's a good example to really showcase how well this works. So when they first started, this is March 21st of last year, from 3 uh, p.m. to 4 p.m. And you can tell just by looking at the graph that a lot of the drivers were arriving after the light had turned red. And very few were actually coming through while the light was green. So they took in this information, they made the timing changes they needed to, and here is the same intersection, same phase, same time of day, just the very next day. And you can see that they went from an 11% arrivals on green up to a 68.7% and they didn't have to change their green time very much at all. They went from 38.4% green time up to just 39.7. So this raised their PR score from 0.29 to 1.73. And as I said, 1.5 is what you're aiming for. So this is very effective in getting this moving. And I've got to tell you, if any of us arrived at an intersection that's performing like the one on the left, I think you would get quite a few complaints. Speaking of, of those complaints and what uh, what makes them happen, uh, this is probably one of my favorite screens that iTerrace offers in their SPMs. This is the wait time screen. And what this is gonna show you is your max wait times versus your unnecessary wait times. So the first thing you're gonna notice here is that you can hover over each of these plot points. You're gonna get a little uh, tool tip that pops up that's gonna tell you exactly what, what time and how long the wait times were. And as you can see here that there's two kinds, there's a green line and a blue line. So the green is your total wait time depending on that time of the day. The blue is your unoccupied wait time. So this is gonna tell you the time that people were waiting at the stop bar when there wasn't traffic going through the intersection. And from experience, I can tell you that time legitimately slows down when you're sitting at an empty intersection at a red light. And that is what's gonna cause people to call and complain. If they're sitting there, I mean, some of these go as high as 30, 50 seconds. If someone's sitting at the stop bar for a minute without anyone else coming across, they're gonna perceive an issue with that intersection. And this chart is gonna be able to get you ahead of that and see these problems before they become real problems. So take a break from the reports for a second. I wanna kind of talk about how this works uh, in the back end behind the curtain. Uh, here's kind of how things are laid out when they come into the ITER system. You've got your timestamp. As you can see, it goes down to the 10th of a second. You've got an event code. These event codes are cool. So these are one of, it's gonna be one of 256 predetermined standardized event codes. So all controller manufacturers came together and they created the standardized event code. So this is what iTerris is able to use to make sure that they are completely agnostic. All these controllers are speaking the same language. iTerris understands this language. 
It's going to show you what phase the event code happened on, and it's going to give you a brief summary of what the event is. What Iteris does is it takes this raw information, which this chart in real life over just a day would be massive. I couldn't imagine receiving this in an email. So it takes this and it plots it into these different charts so that you can easily check it out and get the visualization that you're looking for to be able to quickly understand what's going on instead of trying to have to just scroll through endless, endless data in an Excel, Excel chart. So to kind of show you what that information looks like in its full screen, this is your phase termination detail screen. This is going to show every phase's termination time and cause uh, X. When you see these little X's here, it does mean that that happened with presence. So that means someone was at the stop bar. Uh, gap outs are in green, max outs are in orange, and you've got your force offs in blue. And then I'm not sure if you guys can see, these are pretty small, but these little yellow triangles represent pedestrian calls. So when someone presses the button or if you have pedestrian detection at the intersection. Um, and then, like I said, force off of the present is when the phase changed with vehicles on the stop bar. Um, the screen can be filtered. Uh, any of this data can be filtered by user or by intersection. You can pick which phases you want to see at the same time. You can pick what time of day, what day you want to look at. It's all right there. Super easy to figure out. If you can use Facebook, you can use Iteris SPMs, I promise. So let's see an example of how this has helped one of our customers in the past. So like I said, this is going to give users a quick understanding if there's any equipment malfunctioning or if there's any problems at the intersection. While at the intersection is observed in this specific case that sometimes pedestrian phases were going to be were being serviced without pedestrians actually pushing any of the buttons. They pulled up the phase termination detail chart and it shows that the pedestrian activations are exactly the same for phases three and four, which indicates a problem with the APS controller, uh, the pedestrian controller. Um, also notice that each time that the ped phase is served, it's actually extending the time of that vehicle phase. So phase three and four, when there isn't a ped call, they're only about 10 to 12 seconds long. But whenever it does serve this ped call, it's extending it by like 30 seconds each time. So a false ped call is delaying their main street from running for up to 40 seconds. And if that happens over and over and over again, you're going to see that impact all of your nearby intersections. It's going to become a problem. So this was a quick and easy way for them to see that there was a problem out there. They could tell that there was something wrong with their system and they're able to go out there and fix it and get things running back to normal. On this, we can see the same holds true for detection equipment as well. So here we're seeing on January 2nd of 2019 at 6.15 a.m. phase one and six, both were using the same camera for detection at Williams and DB Wood, uh, putting constant calls. So Iteris received email alerts uh, that told them they're having too many max outs between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. So the SPM charts confirmed that phase one and six had constant calls causing max outs and Iteris technician went out there at 10.30 in the morning and he's able to reset the detector, detector processor and the problem was cleared out and the detection started working properly. So from the time of 6 or in the morning to 10 in the morning is the only time they had to deal with this issue that if they didn't have these alerts, if they didn't have the system, could have gone unnoticed for a relatively long time. So this is the phase termination summary screen, uh, which takes the information from the previous phase termination details and summarizes the information in an easy to understand and review format. And like everything else on this Iteris SPM software, all these charts are easily downloadable and can be uh, uh, exported into whatever kind of format you'd like them to be in. Um, this is a great way to tell uh, where or how you want to allocate your splits. This is going to give you an idea of bin durations, so what phases may have some time to give, whereas what phases do not. Uh, this is going to give you a good high-level sense of what's happening with your gap outs and your force offs. So your gap outs are in green, your force offs are in blue. Um, and this chart helps traffic engineers decide where they can take the time from. So as I said, you can see here on this screen, that uh, phase two and six don't have any time to give. They're, they're pretty much fully saturated, but phases one, four, and five have quite a bit of time to give. So there's some changes that can be made at this intersection to better serve uh, the, the cars that are arriving at the stop bar. So they made changes, and as you can see, phase three was impacted probably the most. Uh, they're able to give a little bit more time from these phases into phase three, which I don't know if you can read it, but this was a left turn for northbound. 
And left turn lanes are notoriously a problem if they're getting held up because what's happening is those guys are coming back to where that left turn lane merges into the rest of traffic, causing backups all the way back to previous intersections. And that's just people trying to turn left. The people trying to go through can't move either because they're stuck behind those people waiting for that left turn lane to flush. So being able to set their timing and flush out that left turn lane allowed for traffic to kind of ease up and loosen up and allow for better serving. Here's another example of how this is going to work. So uh, they're having, again, they're having issues. These issues started from the moment they turned on their SPMs. Uh, they're noticing that they're having constant max outs on phases one, four, six, and eight. Uh, and and because this was occurring on multiple phases, it was apparent that this was a bad, this wasn't a bad camera or bad video detect uh, video processor. It turned out that the BIU was had actually gone bad. And one thing, if you've noticed, is I've kind of showed these alerts here on the screen, is that kind of one of the big tip-offs to these guys that there's something wrong is they're getting max out alerts at 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., which is a, a huge indicator that there's a problem because unless something crazy is going on, you're not going to have that much traffic at 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. So, you know, they're able to see gold is bad. They're maxing out at a weird time of day. There's a problem. We need to get out there and fix it. Excuse me. All right, so this is the preempt and transition chart. So agencies don't realize that if you're in transition, your timing doesn't matter. So all of that time and money that you've put into perfectly timing your signal is totally wasted because it's never going into the timing it needs to be in. Um, things that can cause signals to go in transition, you've got your preempt, pattern changes, and PED detection are the big ones. So on this screen, you've got one bar per plan. This shows when it's in step and when it's not. Uh, the green portions mean that it's it's performing in step, whereas the black portions mean it's in transition at those times. Um, you can see here at the top that these little yellow indicators, kind of like on that uh, that previous chart, these show when the pedestrian buttons have been activated or if there's been pedestrian detection done. So you can see here on plan 40 and 43, they spent 70% and over 80% of their time in transition. Uh, this agency couldn't understand what was causing the major delays in their corridor until they looked at this screen and they could clearly see that the PED button was making constant calls and causing problems. So when they fixed it, you can see that it made a huge difference in the amount of time they're spending in transition. Now they're only spending 10% in transition and that's when they're doing their PED calls here. So you can see that each of these little black bars are associated with when the actual PED calls are happening, not just a button that was stuck down, constantly calling, constantly putting in those requests. Another really interesting chart that uh, iTerrace offers on their website uh, is turning movement counts. This is gonna give you hourly counts that are put into 15 minute bins. It's gonna show your right turns on red or green, uh, your permissive or your protected lefts. Um, if you hover over this graph at any point, as you can see here, you get these little tool tips. They're gonna give you the breakdown of what you're hovering over. Um, each one of these lines represents a different turning movement. You have a nice little diagram in the middle that tells you where they're coming from. Um, you can click and drag on these, and it's going to zoom in to a closer view of the data. So like right here, I think we're looking at a total of nine days. So if you wanted to look at just May 4th or May 3rd, you could zoom into that and get a more detailed, again, every 15-minute view of what happened that day. And then you just simply click Reset Zoom, and it's going to take you right back to this view that you start off with, which again is set here uh, as a max range of seven days. But you can set that over here on the left-hand side to draw these charts. I've said a couple times that these SPMs, all these charts, every screen can be downloaded, uh, it can be printed, uh, shared however you'd like. So just for an example for this screen, if you download the turning movements, you're gonna get a nice little graph in Excel. It is totally modifiable, so you can set your own filters um, and you're gonna get a full breakdown of each of the movements at that intersection. Here's another good one. This is clearance interval activity. So essentially this is gonna tell you when vehicles enter the inter intersection relative to the end of the green time. So you can see the end of the green time is represented by the very bottom of the graph and then you go into your yellow and then you go into your yellow clearance and then the, the dotted red line here is when the light is fully red. So when you look at this chart, it's gonna show you uh, all the phases are represented by their own little colors, but it's gonna show you each one of these dots that appear above this dotted red line are people who are running the red light. Now, some of these guys are really close. Like some of these guys, I would say that that light wasn't red, it was like a burnt citrus. But some of these up here, farther away from that red line are clear red light running. 
Um, and this is a great way to use it as a safety metric. You're gonna understand if maybe your timing needs a little tweaking to make it safer for people to make it to the intersection and have time to slow down and stop, or they need a little bit of time to get through. If that's not the problem, this is a great thing to share with your local PD. These guys can use this information and understand where to allocate their time. Maybe a, a police officer needs to sit in the parking lot at that corner for a little while, uh, let people know that there's a police presence there and, and that they can't be running red lights like this. It's, it's incredibly dangerous. That's what causes a huge amount of fatal traffic, traffic accidents or T-bone crashes in a red intersection. So that's me covering what is the Iteris SPM software. Let's say so that's that's everything that we've had for years that's what people have, have really loved but this is what iteris just recently i mean this is hot off the press introduced that they're going to now be implementing their clear guide data into their spms so and, and this was i think I, I was working on this presentation last week and this kind of just got tossed out there so i i had to show you guys some of this stuff because it's, it's really cool there's there's some data that I personally know a lot of people have been looking for to be integrated into uh, what they want in SPMs, and I think Iteris did a really good move by by showing this. So, what is your Clear Guide? Uh, Clear Guide is a proprietary licensed web-based service. Uh, it analyzes traffic data, measures roadway performance, and provides tools and reports that provide actionable information for roadway network management. Uh, it's cloud-hosted and web-based, just like the SPMs, and it's an analytic and visualization tool. Uh, ClearGuide processes data from various sources, including data from third-party traffic data providers to aid clients with their decision-making process. And I'm going to kind of dive into each of those here shortly. One thing I do want to kind of preface this with is there is a ton to ClearGuide. I was only able to really scratch the surface. I think that the map functionality of this service is one of the coolest uh, one of the best running in the industry. So that's really what I wanted to show you guys here. So speaking of here, um, ClearGuide does work with here technologies and that's a real time, this is real time data that's built upon the aggregation of billions of speed observations obtained from vehicles traversing the roadway network. Uh, currently there's over 100 billion probe data points that are processed monthly through this real time traffic system. Uh, this data is available 24 seven, 365 and it's published every minute of every day. So this isn't, dependent on if something's turned on or off, it is constantly, constantly feeding you this data. Here obtains this probe data from a large variety of consumer and commercial sources to ensure coverage, breadth, and depth. And through the years of experience, they found that the appropriate mix of consumer and commercial devices represent, this represents the reality of the index of travel behaviors and speeds throughout the day in both rural and urban, which that's a big deal. It's a, a you know, it's one thing to be able to get all this data in downtown Tampa or Chicago but using this many data points and having access to both sides of the spectrum allows them to even work in some of the more, you know, less populous areas. ClearGuide displays real-time uh, and historic traffic data in a graphical web-based format with several map layers that the user can select. Uh, there are several speed layer options. Uh, one is gonna show you the, the speed that they're observing versus free, free flow speed on that roadway. Uh, one is gonna show speed anomalies. So this is gonna show you where the traffic is worse or better than normal at that time of day, that day of uh, week. Uh, you get data quality tiles. So it's gonna show you how, how good the data is that you're looking at there, how substantial it is. And there's even a layer that's gonna show you uh, roadway network uh, classification so what kind of roadways you're looking at which for some people may not be as important but it's a, it's a nice little touch one really cool and super simple thing that they've added to this is this uh, graphical slider tool and essentially what this allows you to do is you can slide this slider to any time of the day in the day that you have selected here on the left side and you can press the play button and what it's going to do is it's going to play that day from the moment you pulled the slider and show you how the roadways are changing. So these colors on these roadways are gonna change depending on what's going on. So, you know, downtown Tampa would be red at 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning and then it'd start to loosen up. And, you know, your incoming traffic from the local neighborhoods would turn red on, on that path. And then as the PM peak approached, it would switch over. And this is a really cool way to kind of just see what's happening in a nice little animated format and be able to understand how your traffic's behaving throughout the day. Or if you have some weird events that happen on a certain day, you can go back and run the slider and run the animation and see, you know, oh, we had a breakdown on I-5. How did traffic react? How did people go around and try to divert from this? And another really cool thing is, let's say you want to save it. Let's say it's, it's an anomaly that you want to keep track of and you don't want to have to remember the day. 
they have this little heart icon that you can click and what that's going to do is it's going to allow you to save that uh, you can export it as a, a quick little mp4 video and share it that way or keep it logged for any time in the future um, a big important tool for this is being able to not just see your little segments of the roadway, but create your routes. So what you can do is you can right click on the map and at certain points and you can add your start or your ends of your routes. Um, you can also add waypoints. So you don't have to have the route go exactly how the system programs it to. If you wanted to see a specific way that users travel, you can right click and select the uh, add a waypoint to give more of a uh, custom route put out there and you can name your routes which is great because i know here in portland there could be hundreds of different routes through town and this is a, a quick and easy way for you to organize them and come back and you have a search tool in clear guide that you can type in the name of your route and it'll automatically pull it up you don't have to pick it from a huge list either um, this one is very very cool this is your bottleneck detection so what this is is it shows bottlenecks are visible on the clear guide real-time map has an overlay of any of the other layers uh, the head node is illustrated by a red push pin and the queue length is shown by a thick red line overlaid on the road uh, users can click on the push pin to see the details about the current queue length uh, you can see the delay for each traveler in minutes and you can see the head of the queue and the back of the queue and it can determine that length uh, using the link meta metadata the map has filters to allow users to filter out bottlenecks below certain minimum delays or queue length thresholds. And here on the left, which is something I think is, is really interesting, and I believe Washington County, Oregon has actually shown a little bit of interest in something like this, which is your top 10 bottlenecks, your top 10 pr problematic areas. You can keep this list up. You can separate it by top all time which essentially be throughout the entire day or you can look at what's just the the big bottle next in the morning as opposed to pm and this is going to be a great way for you to see these areas of concern the ones that are consistently being problematic or if in bad weather does that change does that does that top 10 kind of switch up to roadways that may not be as uh free flowing if there's rain on the roadway and then you can export this just like anything iTerris does. You can export it via CSV. I think there's quite a few actually uh, different versions of output files. You have the access to the incident feed. Um, for those of you who use Google Maps to get around in your car for GPS or Waze, which is this is where uh, here and Waze both feed into this overlay. Uh, because Waze has this connected citizens program, any of these participants can report things that they see on the roadway. Let's say a branch has fallen on the road or there was a you know, a minor bumper to bumper accident uh, at one of the intersections. They report it and it can appear after so many reports happen uh, on your map here as an overlay. Um, and they can come and go. And as you can see, this is still part of the slider tool. So if you want to see how long it took for an accident to clear up or what have you out of any of these, weather, it'll show you if there's a significant amount of snow or fog on the roadway. You can play that through and watch these incidents appear and, and go away. So uh, because it's using this both from here, the here incident feed and the connected citizens program from Waze, you're getting a huge uh, data collection that's going to give you a really good peek as to what's going on in your roadways. And this one's another implementation that I've heard a lot of agencies look for. Uh, obviously, weather impacts your travel times, weather impacts your roadways quite a bit. Here in Portland, your travel time can double just if there's a slight rain. You'd think we would learn how to drive in the rain here by now, but uh, apparently not. Um, this is gonna show you your precipitation, your uh, predicted precipitation. So what the forecast is showing, it's gonna show you how much snow has been accumulated and what your wind speeds are in certain areas. And again, you can play this through the day. You can actually watch it roll just like you're watching on the weather channel. You can watch storms roll through and see how they impacted your roadways and where the worst of the storm was. So those are just kind of a couple of the mapping features that uh, ClearGuide brings. There's reports as well. I, I didn't want to make this a two hour long presentation just showing a whole bunch of graphs and a whole bunch of charts. So if you want to see a more deeper dive into this information, I would be happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting so we can go over this stuff. Um, obviously, ClearGuide is an incredibly powerful tool and has nearly unlimited uses. Uh, for regional operations, this is going to allow you to better plan for major events, be it uh, the release of maybe a large concert or a large sporting event, or the impact of a strong storm rolling through your area. 
Um, having access to your bottleneck prone areas can help agencies better prioritize construction projects and understand what planned detours, what kind of effect those are going to have on the surrounding uh, roadways. ClearGuide will better reinforce ITERIS's SPM, giving users the ability to better manage arterials with more data to support the prioritization of signal retiming down problematic corridors. Uh, once retimings have been made, this data will directly show the effectiveness of these changes and better allow agencies to hone in on the best use of their funds and better showcase their successes. It's not always about finding the problem. Sometimes it's about showing that the ideas you had, that the work you put forth was successful, that it made a difference. Um, construction projects can now easily be monitored and, and analyzed, showing agencies what impacts lane closures are having on overall commute times. Agencies will be able to better plan for detours and further reduce the issues that drivers commonly have when construction is done on their route to and from work or their common routes. I know that if there's construction on the one way I love to go to work, I will do some crazy things. I will take detours that may not be thought of, or I'll follow a group of people doing these detours, and suddenly we're putting strain on surrounding signals that have never seen those kind of volumes before. This is going to give you a peek into that. This is going to give you that data that you need. So I understand I covered a lot in today's presentation, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have more questions. As I said, give me a call reach out to me, reach out to any of our team members in your area. We'd be happy to take you through this. We'd be happy to give you a live presentation, uh, let you get your hands on it, and and hopefully uh, show you that this is one of the best SPM softwares out there. This is gonna this is gonna give you a wealth of information that is super helpful. And just to kind of retouch, you know, I know that we provide Siemens, but iTerris is totally agnostic. If you have any of these controllers on the screen, you can use iTerris SPMs. You can implement this uh, at your TMC. You've got the communications. You've got the detection out there. You're spending, you know, most agencies spend between $30,000 and $40,000 uh, per intersection on just hardware. And if you have all of that on there, you know, the missing puzzle piece is pulling SPMs in, bringing all of that together and giving you the data that you're, you're paying for. I mean, if you've got it, why not pay for it? Uh, that's all I have for you guys today. I, I hope that it was interesting. I hope that I showed you guys some things maybe you didn't know before. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and toss it back to Connor. Maybe you guys had some questions while I was presenting. I'd be happy to answer. All right, thanks, Jason. We'll get going on the Q&A. So please use your chat uh, feature within your GoToWebinar toolbar if you have any questions. Uh, Jason, looks like we did have a handful of questions that came in while you were speaking, so we can go ahead and tackle those. Uh, the first one is, if the SPM data is stored on the cloud, who owns it and is it resold? Uh, that is a very good question, and that's something I've heard many times. Um, just because it's stored in the cloud does not mean that it's being sold to the highest bidder. That is your data. It is being collected by your team. That is your data to own. So, no, you don't have to worry about that happening. Great. Next one for you is, what if there isn't enough probe data from here or ways in certain areas? Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about like, if you have a very rural road, or if you're in a place where maybe technological penetration isn't very high, so you don't have uh, as many people maybe using the GPS function on their phones or what have you. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there's a couple ways to approach it. Obviously, um, there's ways to look into how this is going to serve you before we provide it, but also uh, a really cool part of ClearGuide is that you can pull in probe data from other probes. So from, let's say, uh, Bluetooth detectors or uh, Wi-Fi detectors. They can go on the side of the road uh, in places that maybe you're not getting as dense of a sample size as you'd like. You can get the real-time analytics from one of those devices. Great, and this question looks like it may have came in um, you know, as it pertains to a slide. It just says, do you need downstream detection? Do you need downstream detection? Um, okay, that's a that's a good question. Uh, you don't need it as long as the detection you're using can see in the intersection you're able to get those turning counts. But I, I, we have had some interesting scenarios, and I think this more pertains to some of our adaptive products. But you can, in some time, in some situations, if you're not able to get that advanced detection you need at a certain intersection. If you have an intersection that's say a block away that does have downstream detection, we have been able to work it out so that we can use that downstream detection to supplement your lack of advanced detection at that intersection. Um, I wish I had a drawing uh, and my art skills are not very good, but essentially you would be looking 
at one intersection towards the next and you'd be able to uh, put some detection zones that could still speak to the software and uh, get you that advanced detection for sure. But no, you don't need downstream detection for this to work. Great, looks like uh, last question for you here. Uh, it says, who is out there using ClearGuide? No, that's a, that is a valid question. You don't want to buy something and be the, the first one sometimes. Uh, a lot of people are. Um, here in Oregon, ODOT does use uh, certain aspects of ClearGuide, so they are a customer. I know that UDOT, the, the mecca of SPMs, is using ClearGuide. Uh, Caltrans has uh, ClearGuide software. I believe Pasadena is using it. And then I know that a big implementation of the IPEMS and ClearGuide software is being uh, done in Toronto in Canada. So not only here in the United States, but also in our friendly neighbors in the north. Great, that looks like all the questions we had today. So thank you, Jason, for the presentation. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you, everybody.